Yeah. Hey, F O G Ashrasha. Okay, trying to pronounce your name right. How are you doing? I'm okay. How are you doing? Doing all right, hanging in there. So tell us about yourself. Um, you know, I'm just a believer in Christ. I wanted to ask a question because I heard you talking to that guy um that called in on your show. He uh was talking to you about talking to a Hebrew Israelite. And I wanted to ask you about a scripture that shows God discriminating against other nations. And I wanted to get your take on it, not so much argue you down or anything like that, but maybe some exegesis from an expert might have some clarity to the situation. Okay, what's the verse? Not that I'm an expert, but... So it's in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, and um, it starts off talking about the indentured servants. And then it juxtaposes them from other types of servitude. Um, when you talk to that guy about racism, would you agree that if I showed preferential treatment to a certain people group and said, you guys can't be slaves, but these people can, is that a form of racism? It depends. It depends. Well, in that particular situation, if I'm saying that these people, because of who their fathers are, they could be slaves, but not you guys. That would be racism, I would think. And it could be whites upon whites, too, because yeah, a lot of people don't know that there were white slaves in America, too, and it's yeah. not talked about. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's good because in context of what we're talking about, the I believe it was the Irish, right? They yeah. would be the indentured servants being talked about here in Leviticus. Yeah. If I may, I'll just illustrate it. It says um, in verse 41, again, Leviticus 25, I'm going to start at 42, actually. It says, oops, I just slipped. Sorry about that. So I'm looking at 39, actually. It says, if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant, but as a hired servant and, and as a sojourner. He shall be with thee and shall serve thee into the year of Jubilee. So they have that period in which they serve, then they go free unless they are married and they want to stay with their wife and kids. Are you familiar with this? Uh, I've read about it before, but it's not top of my head. It's not there. Okay. I'll just read it as a refresher and then hopefully any of the gentlemen on the panel can add to it if they are familiar. It says, and then he... De, um, then he depart from thee, both he and his children with him, and he shall return into his own family and unto the possession of his father shall he return. For they are my servants, which I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as bondmen. Thou shalt not rule over him with rigor, but thou shalt fear thy God. So, you know, that's where it says they only get to be indentured servants. Right. Any of you uh, gentlemen familiar? Well, the countrymen is talking about it. it looks like what's going on is that the fellow countrymen of the Israelites are not to be uh, are not to be a, a chattel slavery. There's different kinds of slavery in the Bible that was used. Exactly. And, and a lot of people don't know that. Uh, so Jewish slaves were to be set free at the year of Jubilee and non-Jewish slaves were to be kept perpetually. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that racist? Yeah. Well, I don't know. You see, because... Uh, like, for example, slaves could be beaten, but so could the Jews. And people don't know that. They say only the, the slaves are beaten, not with rods. No, the, the, the uh, Jews were told and commanded to be beaten with rods as well. It was a just a, it was average upon them. The issue of skin color, I don't I in my research of skin color issues back then, it wasn't like it is now or people are more prejudiced about stuff like that. It wasn't that. It was more your culture your ethnicity as a people group like the Assyrians or the Jordanians or whoever and you're from that area because there's often a mix of people within that so they were more concerned with how you looked and how you spoke and things like that and would, uh, go ahead no I was just saying I agree like the concept of race that we have now is more so dealing with the color caste system that was in right. fairly recently, whereas, like you said, we're looking at different cultures. Um, the way we would to determine race back then is by your father. So 
the same way right. in the Torah, the Israelites would uh, present themselves by the house of their fathers and that dictating their tribes. In like manner, they would discriminate against other people groups according to who their father was. Right. For example, there was even a time where the tribe of Benjamin were Israelites. There was a, a saying going around the nation that they needed to refrain from dealing with the tribe of Benjamin. But if I look at race, just the base model of what that is and racism, that preferential treatment, when it says verse 44, both thy bondmen and thy bondmaids, which thou shalt have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you. Of them shall ye buy bondmen and bondmaids. Moreover, the children of the strangers that do sojourn among you, of them shall ye buy. And of their families that are with you, which they beget in your land, and they shall be your possession. And ye shall take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit them for a possession. They shall be your bondmen forever, but over your brethren, the children of Israelites, thou shalt not rule over with rigor. Now, the part that piques my interest the most is that when you look at that rigor, it says you're not supposed to rule over one with severity, but the other one that you can, that rigor, that's the Hebrew word, uh, or however you pronounce it properly. I don't want to offend anybody who's a fluent Hebrew speaker. What do you say to that aspect of this law? Uh, it's, you're going quickly, and I'm trying Sorry. to find the verses to look at it. You're using a different version, so it's hard to follow. But I, oh, what I did was, that's all right. In my BHI notes, I put that, no, in my slavery notes. I have uh, an outline on slavery, 13 pages long, and I just added that pericope of Leviticus 25, 39 through 43. I've already analyzed uh, the next few verses, 24 through 46. I mean, I just, I got my notes on that. So here I have to look at that. And when we talk about things like this, I always like to be more cautious than I normally would by saying I need to look and see. Because I do know that a lot of times, and I'm glad you you know used the word, that a lot of times the words have different meanings and different contexts within the Hebrew. And I want to know what's going on. So because this is a potentially touchy subject for a lot of people, then I slow down because I don't want yeah. it to be misconstrued. But if you were to, if you were to write like right now, I get my notes. If you right now, I have Leviticus twenty five thirty nine through forty three as a note, and then uh, the the issue. Okay, and so I want to type out what you see the issue is, and then that'll clue me in on what to look at in it, so I can develop a response. Okay. So what's the issue? And don't go too fast. I'm going to type it. I'm going to type it out as fast as I can. It's okay. I, I'll definitely uh, pace myself with this one. So the issue is that if God is not racist, why is there a law in the Torah, which is the righteousness of the Israelites? Why is there a law in the Torah that juxtaposes the other nations from the Israelites in such a way that the nations around the Israelites can be oppressed or ruled over harshly or indefinitely while an Israelite only has to serve for seven years? That's a good question. Uh, I have a, two theories about that already. So they can be ruled harshly, but not so with their countrymen. Okay, so let me read this back to you. Uh, if God is not racist, why is there a law in the Torah that juxtaposes the other nations from the Israelites so that they can be ruled harshly, but not so with their countrymen? Uh, all right. Yeah. Okay. So one of the reasons that G, that uh, God was harsh with other nations is because it was through the nation of Israel that the Messiah would come. So he would often say to the, the Jews after warning the false nations, go out there and kill them all. Because he did not want the uh, the corruption, idolatry, sins to infect the Israelite nation and thereby um, thereby thwart the arrival of the Messiah. So God is seen as being tough, but, but you know, like the Canaanites go wipe out man, women, and children. Well, he, history shows us that they got warnings from God and various prophets for like two or 300 years before that happened. So God's patient, but you know, so that's one thing. The other thing I, I think might be uh, that the reason that the Jews are not to be permanently bound is because it might reflect the issue of salvation 
because Jesus was sent covenantally only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15, 24, and that the Jews represent the people of God. And I'm going to do this loosely. The Jews represent the redemptive work of God as he's working through them, but they weren't all redeemed, but the redemptive work of God through a chosen people and that the chosen ones are not to be permanently enslaved to sin. They'll be set free from it. And I think that kind of model is why it's imposed upon the countrymen that way. That's a theory I've got. Okay. That's an interesting view as to why. And I won't necessarily give any pushback, but I will ask you a counter question. I thought of another uh, scripture sure. that, um, you know, it rings in my head as what at least could be perceived as racism here. And it talks about usury or um, adding interest unto a loan, right, in layman terms. But um, let me see where it says, this is Deuteronomy 23 and 17. And then we're gonna read through 20 if that's all right. It says, thou shall not lend upon usury to thy brother, usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. And this is King James version, just saying you can't add interest to your brother or anything that you give him. He needs to give you back the principal, nothing more. You can't oppress him in that way. But when it comes to the strangers, it says unto a stranger, thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother, thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land, whether uh, thou goest to possess it. And, you know, anybody can argue um, it's so that the Israelites could remain strong economically, right? If you're impoverishing the people who are the foundation of the nation, you guys are going to collapse eventually. That would be my why there, but it still is a, looks like a form of racism because why not make everybody an Israelite? Um, because when you look at the word usury, it's the Hebrew word neshak, and it means to strike, to sting or figuratively to oppress. And that's just at the most base levels of the, uh, the uh, definition there. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, like the other comment, I'd have to study it to make sure. And I'll, let me look, see if I have anything on Deuteronomy 30, 23, 17. And I have stuff on Leviticus numbers, Deuteronomy 25, 25, 13, but not 20, not set, what was it, 17? Uh, 2317. So I don't have anything on that. Um, so again, I think it might be the issue of bondage uh, that the Israelite people were reflecting the, the truth of who God was in the messianic hope. Someone once said, uh, if you're confused about something in the scriptures, put Jesus in it and see if it makes sense. That, I never forgot that. And it's true. So I would have to look into that and see. Now, one other issue is we have to define what racism is. Because racism today, hey, you're a black guy, I'm a white guy, therefore I'm better than you because you're a black guy. That's racism. And it can re work in reverse, you know. But, but when God says, only for my, Jew my people, the, the people he has called, and then the other nations are to be wiped out, ignored, et cetera, they could be called racism. And in the broad definition, it is racism. But it's not the... Uh, not the way we think. There's what's called denotation and connotation. Denotation's a literal meaning, and connotation's the emotional baggage that goes along with it. So denotation of, of uh, slavery, it, it's, it, it, that is one of the words that has a lot of connotation to it because of our history here in America. But when we go back to ancient Israel and the, and the Middle East, I did a lot of study on it years ago, and I can refresh my memory. It, it was bad. Slavery was bad back then. And believe it or not, the people of Israel uh, treated them very, very good, comparatively speaking. Not that it was always great, but uh, they were not considered property in the same sense as an object owned was. Because mm -hmm. if uh, a slave, uh, the word slave, there's different words for it. I've done a lot of research on this and they're using different senses. They don't, we don't have an English word that reflects the actual Hebrew word for slave and the different kinds of words for slavery. We don't have that differentiation. That's a problem. But at any rate, if a slave were to escape his master and uh, wanted asylum, it was to be granted to him and he was not to be returned. But property was to be returned. Mm 
This is one of the things that people don't understand. The slaves had rights and they, they could own property and, and heads of households and things like that. But anyway, back to the usury thing. That's something I'd have to see. I don't think it's racist. I think it's uh, I think it is God collectively saying redemptively speaking, the people of Israel are only to have certain kinds of oppression put upon them because ultimately it's symbolizing the Messiah coming through them who sets us free from all kinds of, of oppressions and variations. And I think that's one of the underlining principles there. So I can prove it's that? not racist. My bad. Sorry. So what, what church do you go to, Ash? Um, I'm a minister. Oh, you're a minister? Yeah, I'm a street minister, fire of God. So do you believe in the Trinity? No. No? No, sir. Is Jesus God in flesh? No, he's a God. Okay. I'm so what you would tell call you. a black Hebrew Israelite. You, I'm sorry? I said I'm what you would call a black Hebrew Israelite. Okay, yeah. Yeah, you're not a Christian, okay? Um, I follow Christ, but I'm not uh, I'm not in favor of a Christian. No, I'm you don't. all of those tenets. Um, no, you, but you know what? You, you're intelligent and articulate and you're polite. I would like to keep in contact with you and discuss things with you. I would like that very much. Um, if I could, I want to ask one more thing. I'm okay. sure that you're of the school of thought that uh, Isaiah 14 came to pass when the Israelites left Babylon, the one that was ruled over by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, that, again, I'd have to look in context to see. Okay. I would like to... Uh, read it and again i don't want to hog it up i like uh right. discourse if anybody else wants to chime in that'd be fantastic um so isaiah 14 says for the lord will have mercy on jacob and will yet choose israel and set them in their own land and the strangers will be joined with them and they shall cleave to the house of jacob and the people shall take them and bring them to their place. And this is the part that interests me the most. What verse? When it comes to analyzing um, the mainstream doctrine of what salvation looks like, right? It says, what and verse? the house of Israel what will verse? possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And we will take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. When you were talking about Deuteronomy, where we were just reading, and you were saying you would imagine that the way that uh, slavery was to be governed or servitude, for lack of better words, was to be governed under the Torah, that it might have um, something that was meant to reflect what was going to happen during uh, the time of Christ. Now, this is saying that the Israelites are going to be receiving a salvation in which they will be going back to their land to rule over their oppressors and have them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. Our impression of this text is that this will happen, as you mentioned, under Christ. And I think that the Torah reflects the way that that rulership is going to take place in the latter days as well. What are your views on that? I'd have to look at it to see. Are you talking about verses Isaiah 14, 1 and 2? Um, 1 and 2 and reading down to three so isaiah 14 one, three is actually the most important part but to what i what i would like seriously i'd like if you're to take all these pericopes that you've uh talked about and just cite them out and say here's the issue here's the claim okay e email them to me okay. um, and uh, but I can't promise I'll get to it right away. I got to preach on Sunday. I'm doing D men stuff. My wife's health is not as good as it needs to be. I'm really behind in a lot of stuff, but uh, I'm interested in this. And sometimes what I'll do in bed is just read for an hour before I go to sleep. So I can read stuff like this, but I want those. Here's what I do. OK, I'll just tell you flat out what I do is I like it when people of different groups who disagree. I say, send that to me. Give me the verse. Give me the argument, send it to me. That way I can go look at it in context and I write and I do research. And that's what I wanna do. So if you were to do that, that would be helpful. And then give me your, and if you want, you'll have your feet, your uh, email stuff too. You know, you send me your contact information and stuff like that and, and we can uh, have some conversations. Yeah, I'll put it in the background, Fire of God classroom. 
at gmail.com. I'm gonna put it in the chat that way you can just yeah if, if you put it in the private chat we can we can access it like I just dropped the link. Oh I I see you put it there. Good. Yeah it's right I, there. I, I just I dropped the link in there about Matt's section on slavery. There's 18 or 20 different articles that touch on some of the fine points you were talking about of uh, of uh, servants of your brothers of foreigners of sojourners and different things like that uh, how it was practiced in the day so yeah you can have access to all those articles in that section fire of god awesome. okay there's, there's one more scripture i'd like you to look at during your time uh deuteronomy 30 is very important um versus hold one on, hold on hold on hold on i get to my notes to put that to write it in okay. um so deuteronomy hold on 30. yeah deuteronomy 30 verses one through seven um in my courses i call it the salvation clause okay and so and okay what do you say about that so again i call it the salvation clause uh, because a mo the most high is apparently making um a covenant with the israelites and he's telling them this is what happens if you keep the commandments these are the commandments you need to keep and here He's acknowledging that there are curses that will come if you don't keep them. So here he's talking about what happens uh, if you want to get back on my good side. And here's what happens when you get on my good side. It embeds the punishment of the Gentiles or the heathen or the goyim who are used to punish the Israelites. It, it, it shows a punishment that goes directly on those individuals. I'm going to read it. It says, it shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all nations, whither the Lord thy God hath driven thee, and shall return unto the Lord thy God, and shall obey his voice, according to all that I command thee this day, that thou and thy children with all thine heart in all thy soul that then the lord thy god will turn thy captivity it says he's going to gather them out of all the nations where they're scattered and put them in the land promised to their fathers now this is the part here that i'm talking about where it says that it says that the punishment that the israelites received under the curses would then be put on those said going it says in verse seven and the lord thy god will put all these curses upon thine enemies and on them that hate thee, which persecuted thee. So okay. that's a very important thing to look at in the salvation clause. And I wanted to see if you had a opinion on that text. I've I've already heard Vocab Malone's opinion somewhat. He was a okay. little bit elusive with it, but I feel like you'll be a little bit more clear. Well, I don't understand what the issue is. So in, in verse seven, the Lord your God will inflict those who curse your enemies and on those who hate you, you persecute you. Are you familiar with the suzerain vassal treaty pattern? No. Covenantal treaty pattern? Uh, this looks like it's a covenantal treaty pattern. And covenants are ratified under certain clauses, certain conditions. And it can be abrogated in certain conditions as well. I'm not saying this is the case. I'm just saying this is part of it. And so, uh, plus it's the address of who's being addressed and what the issue is. So let me get this straight. So uh, Most High is making a covenant with Israel, with the Israelites. Uh, keep the commandments, curses if you don't keep them, and what to do if you get back, to get back on the good side of God. Uh, it shows punishment of the non-Jews, all nations. And then verse 7, the curses will be put upon the enemies. And so uh, that's what I'm trying to summarize what you said as accurately as possible. And what's the issue? Is this about how to get saved? Um, yeah, it says that if they repent, basically it's telling them to repent, teach the generations that are following them to repent, then the Most High will give them salvation and put the curses of Deuteronomy on their enemies. That's okay, right. so they get saved by doing what, God. keeping the law? No, they, they, they get saved by God's promise. See, if it was about just keeping the law, then it nullifies any of God's promises. Say, for example, God said, I promise if you keep the law, um, I'm not going to hear you. You're not going to then be able to keep the law and get God to say, hey, thanks. Here's some extra credit points. The Most High's already made the promise here, and that's grace. That's a promise to our forefathers that we didn't necessarily earn. Now what we do is we, we repent.
salvation being the forgiveness of sins? Yeah. How does verse 7 promote the forgiveness of sins? So the forgiveness of sins is in the uh, beginning. It says... Which verse? Let me see here. It says, if thou shalt return unto the Lord thy God and shall obey his voice according to all that I command thee this day. Which verse? I need to know the verse. verse. Sorry. Verse what? Verse two. two. Verses, verses one and two. The end of one says, call to mind your sins. Verse two says, repent. Call to mind and repent. All right. Okay. And return to your Lord to God, obey him with all your heart and your soul, according to what I've commanded today, you and your sons, and the Lord restore you from your captivity. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry about that. It's all right. Okay. So uh, are you willing to have some good dialogues and discussions on this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and you won't get I like offended. I like demeanor a lot more than vocab alone. He, uh, he got a bit rabid on me. <laughs> well, um, what I'm seeing so far is exegetical fallacies and logic errors on your point, your part. But you seem pretty level-headed. I, I, I think you're the kind of guy I could sit across a table with and go, no, 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 this is why. And you go, no, 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 because and we'd have a discussion. That's what I, I kind of get from you. I like that. I hope I'm right. But... Um, See, this is what I want to know. I, I need specifics. This verse is in related to this, and then I can deal with it specifically. Because my notes are that in verses one to two, a uh, call to mind and repentance is what gets you salvation, right? Right. Okay, so at this point, then, okay, see, gets you salvation. Then I would ask, and then I'd be curious. Uh, because I completely disagree with that premise, but I would then be curious to know who you thought Jesus was, who you think God is, the nature of God. I can ask you a lot of questions about that and uh, and stuff about Christ uh, biblically. So, you know, it, it'd be interesting to have some dialogue with you about these things. But uh, I consider BHI to be a cult, okay? I'm not trying to be offensive, but it's a non-Christian religion that leads people to damnation. So if you you know that I believe that, I mean, I'm not mean about it, but that's my position. I mean, a Christian would have to embrace that they are a cult as well. Paul said that he was a part of a cult. So we're just going to stand at two different ends of the table claiming to be from two different cults, which is fine with me because I'm proud of my Lord and Savior, my King, who is the Son of God. What does the term Son of God mean? The Son of God it is... I mean, it means exactly what it says it means. Um, I believe that he was the firstborn of all creatures. What does that mean? What does it sound like it means? I mean, it, oh, I'm he like, was created? No, 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 no. One at a time. I'm being fancy when I say it, is, which is why I'm what, saying is it, what does it sound like it means. Firstborn. What does firstborn mean? It means that he was born first. So if if I'm going to be as scientific as possible without being able to sit in the seat and watch it all happen. Um, Jesus was the first one to be materialized in a world where there was nothing else made material okay. by what we would call the Heavenly Father. He's the first one who made material. Um, okay. So I'm going to take a sidestep here to illustrate something. So the, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the Samaritan, you know, he was a, a hated pe person. He was an, a half-breed, according to the Jewish mindset. They hated the, the Samaritans. And uh, just don't worry about it. I, I know how to, I, trust me, J J just Mr. Kidd, I got, I got this. Um, I gather information first, because yeah, errors are interrelated. You got to get as much information as you can first and tackle each thing. So an example of something is that when a... Uh, when he found that man who was naked and unconscious, do you know why that is significant that he was naked and unconscious? Well, the, uh, the Israelites, what we believe is that we're naked and unconscious. We're unfamiliar with who we are. We don't have an identity because we're identifying with the, we just touched on this word material, the materials of the world. I would take that in parallel with the prodigal son where he gave up all of his substance 
And when he needed substance, the world didn't have anything to give him. So in that sense, we are naked, but we are unconscious in a sense where the scriptures say that if you wander out of the way of understanding, you remain in the congregation of the dead and you are blind, which is actually one of the curses of Deuteronomy. So that's that's how I take that. Well, uh, you make a lot of exegetical mistakes, all right? The first thing you always want to do is go into the context and look at the context immediately. Think of concentric circles like a target. What does it mean right there? What do the words mean right there? And if you do what you just did, which uh, uh, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Christian Science do, they go to someplace else, they, they get a theme and then they impose it in there. The reason that it's important that he was naked and unconscious is that you wouldn't know where he was from. You wouldn't know by his accent what language, what culture, what nation he was from, you wouldn't know by his clothing where he was from either way, either. Because the parable is about uh, who's your neighbor? The neighbor, right? That's what Jesus was talking about, the neighbor. Who, who is he? Because in that culture, you did not talk to Samaritans. And the Samaritan was risking his life. So this is, and I can go into a, a lot about this. That's why. It's like, for example, in the prodigal son, which you uh, brought up, the, the father running to the son was a sign of humiliation. When the son said to the father, uh, give me my inheritance, he's equivalently saying, I want you dead now because you never got the inheritance until after the father died. And so there's all kinds of stuff. And so what you did, I'm just being polite with you, but what you did was you committed exegetical errors right away. And the reason you did that is because you, you're not aware of how to exegete scripture. And what you, you but it looks like you've been taught a thematic umbrella and every sub thing has to be interpreted in light of that. And I could ask you questions. I bet you the more I got to know you in your position, I could ask specific questions theologically out of scripture that you wouldn't be able to answer. That you have a lot of problems with. It's always it's always the case whenever I do this. With I would say that uh, if someone is unfamiliar with the angle that you're coming from, when you're confident in what you're saying and the other person's just getting to know you, it's it's very easy to approach with a dialectic that will put you in a seat where you know exactly what you're talking about, but the other person doesn't. But the fact of the matter is that the scriptures say that under the new covenant. You won't have to teach every man his neighbor saying, know the Lord. Why do I bring that up? Is because we're in a place where everybody's needing to be taught, know the Lord. You got the Holy Spirit one day, right? According to your theology. And then I, I'd imagine you went to seminary school where what, you got more of the Holy Spirit? No, you got doctrinal footnotes. You got pointed towards certain books that you could read. You got pointed towards certain methodologies that other people had confidence in. So what I would want is show me where culturally I'm mistaking what I'm reading, as opposed to just telling me I'm mistaking what I'm reading. That's what I would welcome at this point. All right. So I'm going to ask you a question. Okay. Do you know what it means? You know what it means when a Grimmy uh, snakes somebody on the wave and then the guy gets hydrocoffined? And that was that mean. It means a young surfer out, out there with the waves, with guys who are more experienced, he crosses over him, uh, over the more experienced wave, uh, breaks polite, polite etiquette. And then the guy, the other guy had to go over the falls. He had to get hydrocoff and the wave broke on him because of it. So that's surf talk. So this is, see, everything is done in, all facts exist in a culture, in a context. And we have to understand the context and the cultural context of various things. And um, like the, the uh, unrighteous steward, that's a very rich, culturally uh, rich uh, thing to talk about. Um, and the woman who let her hair down, why was that so significant uh, in Luke uh, 17, I think it is, or 14, I think, when uh, she kissed Jesus' feet? Why is it so significant? That act is incredible. And if you know what the culture is, you know why. Or what is, why is it important to say when the man born blind could see or... Uh, he became blind, he doesn't say whatever. But anyway, Jesus heals him. He says, I see men walking about as trees. There's a reason for that in that culture. And so covenantally, it's a theological thing. And I noticed that my answers are Christocentric, but yours are not. 
And Jesus yeah. says in John 5, 39, that this, you search the scriptures because in them we think you have eternal life, but it is these that bear witness of me. So if you deny that Jesus Christ is God in flesh, no disrespect meant, but you're not a Christian. You don't know who Jesus is. And the reason this is important is because Jesus is the one who reveals the Father, Matthew 11, 27. He's the one who sends the Holy Spirit, John 14, 26 and 15, 26. So if, and the Holy Spirit bears witness of truth, John 16. So, it, and uh, Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. So if you have the wrong Jesus, you could be wrong about everything else. It says Jesus is the one who opens the mind to understand scripture, Luke 24, 45. So if you have Jesus wrong, and that's why I said, what's the term son of, of God mean? And you say, well, it means what it means. It means son of God, but that doesn't answer the question. See, if I were to say to you, does the term son of God mean he's not God? That's generally what they say. Well, I mean, it's written in your law, ye are gods. So yeah. ben Elohim, it means son of God. There's no way to read that and say what it means unless I'm going to read into what I believe it means doctrinally. So what I'm saying is we're kind of sitting here at this table where you're saying, no, you have it wrong doctrinally. And I could sit here equally and say, no, you have it wrong doctrinally. Like, say, for example, you told me culturally I'm missing something about the Samaritan and you told me that definitively it means that the, the man being naked and unconscious himself means that no one would know where he came from unless I misheard you. That's correct. Right. So when I read the text and I'm just going to read it at face value, I can see culturally that we're talking about a wall of partition that may be being torn down here because the Samaritans, there are people who the Israelites used to deal with. Are you familiar with when the Northern Kingdom brought the land of Samaria? And then yeah. later on, they were told not to deal with the, the uh, Northern Kingdom anymore to leave him alone because he's joined under idols. Yeah, that was a long time ago. But what Jesus is doing I mean, here is talking but you see, the man said previously, and who is my neighbor? Uh -huh. So Jesus is answering the question, who the neighbor is. He said, a man, said, uh, a, a man was coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. It was a very dangerous road. It fell among robbers, stripped yeah. him, beat him, left, leave him half dead. A priest is going down the road. A priest was just coming down from that area because that's where the priesthood work was. And if he were to step within a certain uh, distance of the body, if it was dead, then he'd become unclean. He's got to go back up the hill and offer sacrifices. So he goes by on the other side of the road. He's not being a true neighbor. This is all culture. It's all culture. It's all culture. Right. Culturally, right. also, there's the aspect where the priest is supposed to be held with a very high regard. So the people who robbed him didn't care about him, but the stranger did, right? The priest is supposed right. to be held with a the very high regard because he's supposed to look after the people. So we're, they're not looking at them themselves the way that they're supposed to be. But this stranger, he looks at him a certain way. So, yeah, I understand culturally and I understand that there are certain things that will transcend what was happening at the moment when Christ says this is what needs to happen going forward. So you you've told me that my views aren't Christocentric. Is that how you put it? I'm yeah, not Christocentric. And you don't understand the cultural context. I can turn you on to a book where a guy did the research and others Christo have done research. He, like, what? Hebrew? Um, no, because Christo is not Hebrew. So what, what culture am I estranged from? The biblical context and the historical context so you can understand what's going on. Well, there's a separation Hebraically from what's going on Greek, right? Like you have the very physical Hebrew language and then you have the very obscure Greek language. So culturally, there, there can be some variances there when you're looking at the text. But what no, I'm saying is that despite languages are different, but the, they're Israel was they had Greek, Latin and Hebrew uh, being spoken there. And they probably most people probably spoke all three. Because but of the, what are we reading in the New Testament? What I'm saying is that there are Hebrew understandings that you can gain when you look at the New, the New Testament. If you read back into the old, you can gain an understanding of what's happening from a Hebraic lens. Absolutely. But you can't get a Hebraic understanding by just looking at the Greek. So that's why I'm saying, like, what cultural aspect are you saying that I miss? Because oh, you, we take you don't know the cultural aspect. aspect. Yeah. I'm sorry? You just don't know the cultural aspect. I didn't either until I studied it from which, experts which who have aspect? studied it. I'm sorry? Which cultural aspect? Well, for example, here's another one. Why? How was a Samaritan risking his life by helping that guy? How was he risking his life? Which is not said in the text, but he was. So, you know how? Well, one, I'd say which cultural aspect. I still want to know that. But the Samarians, again, I, I did mention this earlier, that the Samarians and the Samaritans. Judeans, 
um, the Samaritans, thank you for correcting me on that, the Northern Kingdom of Israel, the, the remnant of them that were still there, they were known not to deal with the Judeans at the time because there was an intertribal warfare that took place over hundreds of years. We're and talking like, about the parable. In the Bible, the Most High said, don't deal with Ephraim, he's joined unto idols. So there's a lot of history of animosity there. So you're saying it's not written there in the text. I'd say any either of us could draw from what we understand uh, about what was going on between those two uh, sects. Yeah, that's background information. Right here, oh, I have right here. Yeah, right here. Well, how is the Samaritan risking his life? Well, if there's intertribal warfare, just starting off with the intertribal warfare, if there's intertribal warfare and then the Most High is telling the Judeans, don't deal with the Samaritans or don't deal with the northern kingdom. That's before they were called Samaritans. Don't deal with Israel because he's joined unto idols. If, if they are enemies for the sake of the doctrine, then that could, uh, that could tell us that there's animosity between these two groups. So how's he risking his life by helping this guy? Uh, if there's intertribal warfare, that could be a way that the man is risking his life. First thing you do is go to the text. And uh, he took him to an innkeeper and said, look, here, take care of him. I'll be back. That's how he's risking because the man is going to be, his family will miss him. And if they track where he was, and they find out that he was at a, an inn, and then because the Jews would go to this inn, and say, oh, who brought him in? Oh, a Samaritan did. They're gonna instantly want to have vengeance, most probably on the Samaritan because they hate Samaritan so much they can't even think clearly. This is, uh, this is all culturally normative. When the men walked around like trees, the reason that's important is because when the blind man started seeing the men, because in the culture, what people would do is walk up into the hills. I've been to Israel twice, and there's a lot of hills up there in a lot of places. They'd walk up into the hills and get twigs off of branches. They bundled them up. Then they would crawl underneath them and then lift them up on their backs, and they'd walk them down the hills to sell them in town. Mm -hmm. Men walking about as trees. So just a lot of stuff like that. And in the culture, a woman could be divorced for letting her hair down in public. And things like this. So these are things that help. And there are people who've studied this uh, from ancient documents and go over there and, and the culture's unchanged and stuff like that. So I'm just saying it's important. And then there's covenant theology and then abrogation and when the new covenant is ratified. So I'm just saying that uh, the, the generally speaking, the BHI that I've talked to, um, they're good at the Old Testament. They're good at, at some, certain ideas, but they're not good at the culture and they're not good at the theology. What they do is they submit both of those to their presuppositions. So if I could show you that Jesus was God in flesh, would you repent of your BHI? You're not going to show me that. You're going you're gonna to show me where the text feels like it says that. And I want to address something before we move on. Um, but I didn't say that. I said, if I could show you, if it was possible and sure. if it was the case, I would, would you I would hang my hat up for good? OK, so if I, I could show you where he's I, called I, God by I, God, I, would you? Would, so if God really called him God, would that be OK? If you called Jesus God, would that be OK? I said, if God did, that would be fine. OK, he was one. Jesus calls uh, God calls Jesus God. God calls uh, Jesus calls God God. So. If you go to Hebrews chapter one, I got right? an even one in Revelation. But of the son, he, that's the father speaking, says your throne, O God, is forever and ever. God, the father calls Jesus God. But ye are gods. So ye are gods is out of Matthew. Out of John, I'm, not John talking 10. About Matthew. I'm talking about Psalms. Us being called gods in Psalms doesn't make me part of the Trinity. I mean, okay, notice what happened. It's three and twelve, and it says, "Hold on, hold on. If, will I make a pillar in the temple of my God?" And who's talking there? It's Jesus. Jesus. So uh -huh. God has a God. Either way, you've okay. just spoken where God has a God. But what we okay. have to negate is that Israelites were called gods in the Book of Psalms, and Jesus he quotes this himself when he asks, "Is it not written in your law, ye are gods?" When he says that when they say that he was trying to equate himself with the most high, he said, you are called gods also. So what do you have to, to really bring against me? Now, Hold on, it, let me address what you just said, because there's a lot you're not aware of. But John you're moving 10, the place from uh, what we were talking about earlier. But hold on, hold on, you brought this up. I want to respond to it. 
but you, I wanted to not move on from the Samaritan. Remember, I wanted to talk more about the Samaritan. You want to go I wanted, there? I wanted to point out how I said intertribal warfare was an issue. That's a very simplistic answer, and then you gave me a more complex answer, which adds some um, interesting points, right? But you're not going to find that in the text and see this is exactly what the problem was. But what your point didn't do was negate mine, was that there's intertribal warfare. So I want to know why instead of us just reading these scriptures, you're, you're, fly, you're, you're, you're trying to flex your uh, intellectual pecs. It's almost like you're trying to get me to flinch instead of just engaging me. Like, you know, when I'm talking to somebody who doesn't know as much as I do, I simplify everything and I build them up from there. What you're doing is kind of trying to uh, get me to submit. No, it's just not. weird. Because no, no, we were having not. a different conversation moments ago where you weren't comfortable. But I'm not trying to do that. You shouldn't. You ought to be careful when you're having a dialogue with someone you disagree with is reading their motives and tell them what their motives are. It's I mean, you told me my, my doctrine wasn't Christ centric. You told me what wasn't motivating my doctrine instead of asking me where Christ fits into it. So are you now telling me that I shouldn't do something that you did to me first? You misrepresented it. You're not Christ centered in your theology because you didn't mention him Christologically as the center of the covenants and the center of the stuff in the Old Testament. Even when I brought up the Christocentric stuff, you said, huh, that's interesting. You hadn't heard that before. So I'm Christocentric. And you hadn't been that. When I, and then you said it, that uh, I forget what, what you just said, but it wasn't a proper representation. Let's go back to the, this issue here, because when I went to the issue of the Samaritan, you went off to something else. But your first rule is in hermeneutics is you read what it says right there first. That's the first rule. What you did was you took a complex theological perspective from BHI and you impose it on the text. That's not what you do. It's a faulty way of, of exegeting. The Jehovah's Witnesses do that. The Mormons do, do that. You don't do that. You always go from the inside out. You look at the, what it says and you expand and you okay. reverse it. Let's okay. do that with John 3, 16 then. Because oftentimes what I hear any Christian, whether he's a pastor or not, what he does is he just starts at God so loves the world. How about we start at verse 14? How does well, that we, work? We're not done yet. Hold on. Hold on, man. You're going all over the place. Okay. You're right, you're because... Right. Probably. Yeah, to get a focus here. You said you brought up John 10 34. I said, You're God's. Well, the thing is, that starts in John 10 30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. But many good, for, for, uh, then they want to kill him for that. Many good works in the Father I've shown you, for which of these are you stoning me? For a good man, for good work, we don't stone you, but for you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Now, did the Jews believe that he was God? Of course not. Do you believe he, do you believe he was God? Of course not. You agree with, you agree with the Jews. You agree with the Jews who wanted to kill Jesus. They were denying that he was God in flesh. Now, I could ask some technical questions. But you're saying say, all the ones that wanted him to rule in the flesh at that time, they didn't believe he was God either? No, we're not talking about all them. Here you go again. You're going all over the place. No, I agree with the Jews, but you didn't ask me which of the Jews I agree with. You're superimposing oh, your logic on me. I the, just Jew, the Jews in John 10, 30 through 34. Okay. That's what I was talking about. Just John 10, 30. I was quoting it to you. But... I gave you a scripture that said we are God. So why would I want to kill I'm gonna Jesus? I'm going to get to it. I'm going to get to it. I'm very familiar with this. Out of Psalm 82, 6. It's are an imprecatory psalm. You are in line with Caiaphas. Not those okay, look, you're all over the place. you gotta, you got to focus. I'm very you're all over. No, you're not. You're, you're just not. kind of throwing things to see what sticks. No, no, that's not it. Please don't tell me what I'm trying to do. Okay. You know what? Let's start over. You, you brought up where Jesus said me and my father are one. I'll follow your logic from there. We can just, we can kind that's of what, That's what led up to the verse that you quoted in, in John 10, 34, which is Jesus quoting um, uh, Psalm 82, 6. Okay. Uh -huh. So I, I'm very familiar with this. I knew right at where it was. I knew the context, but you didn't read the context. And Jesus, he says in John 10, 30, I and the father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to throw at him. They want to kill him for that. Mm-hmm. He said, many good works of the Father I've shown you. For which of these are you stoning me? And he said, for a good work, we're not stoning you. But you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. And they want to kill God. him. They want to kill him because they thought he was claiming to be God. So the, well, there's several questions. One of them is, did the Jews right there, did those Jews he's talking to, did they believe he was God in flesh? Of course not. More and, importantly, and you don't agree, you agree with the scriptures as much as they like to prop themselves up to. That's what he was constantly calling them out for. Did they because, deny he was God? Sorry. 
They denied he was God in flesh, just like you do. He then goes and he says, John 10, 34, it's not written in your law. I said, ye are gods. He quoted what's called an imprecatory psalm. To oh. imprecate is to wish harm on somebody. And so if you go to Psalm 82, you'll find out that what he talks about is that the, uh, and I'll go right there. Okay. He says, God takes a stand in his own congregation. He judges amidst the, the rulers. How will you, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? He's talking about the unrighteous judges of Israel and oh. that they had the power of life and death. And you can go down to verse seven. Nevertheless, you'll die like men. It's an oh. imprecatory psalm. And when Jesus was saying that to the Jews, he was bringing up the imprecation against them, calling them unrighteous judges. And they're screwed at that point because if they say, well, the Bible doesn't say you're gods, you know, but it says it does not say that. And you're the ones who have this power of life and death. And yet you're complaining about me saying I'm the son of God. Because why did they want to kill him? Because the term son of God in the context meant he was God. And you can go to John 5, 18 for that. And so you're plus, saying when, when Jesus says that him and the father are one means that he is God. Definitively. Well, it's the Shema, hero Israel, the Lord our God is one. He says, I and the Father are one. They want to kill him. Uh -huh. Why would they want to kill him? Notice what happens. They said the they pick up stones again to throw at him. But if you do research, you'll find out that the, if you go back in John, the very next place where, uh, previous place where they wanted to kill him, was in John 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. They pick up stones again to throw at him. They want to kill him, but he hid himself. And then in the next place of them stoning him is John 10, 30 through 34. And they want to kill him. Now, here's a question. What was it that Jesus had said, show me the verse, that what he said is where the Jews thought he's claiming to be God? Because if you can't answer it, it means you don't understand the theology, don't understand what the Jews thought, don't understand what Jesus was teaching. You won't understand the text. You just illustrated that there were more than one point. Yeah, there is. For one. So why would I he's, pick one? He's, well, you pick one you want, but there's lots of questions well, that are related to this. Why would I pick one point as, as to which one if there were a few? I would pick each of those points. But what I would look at and say is that from my view, he wasn't wrong in what he said. They were wrong in the way that they were analyzing the situation and their carnality or their lack of understanding. So they but were I'm denying he was God. God. Still, how Jesus' statements makes him God. And I'm, I'm, I'm really wanting you to harp on how him saying me and the Father are one, because that was the first point you made. How does that make him God? Because it's referring, referring back to Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hero Israel, the Lord of God is one. He says, I and the Father are one. Mm -hmm. And wait a minute. Would you say that you and God the Father are one? Yeah. I'd even what? agree with Paul where he said being many are one. Mm -hmm. So right? when Jesus is saying of, it. Does that make you a part of the Trinity because the body of Christ is all one? No. No. And so what was it that Jesus was saying and why was he saying it that caused him to think he's claiming to be God? Because he doesn't do anything that the father doesn't do. What he sees the father do, he does. He doesn't do anything unless the father tells him to do so. John 5, 19, John and 5, 30. That, uh, Enoch walked with God, I would imagine. Okay. So how is it Jesus can do whatever he sees the father do? Because he's given the power to do so. So he has all authority in heaven and earth, right? Given to him, not okay. taken for himself. Uh, that's another issue. So he has all authority in heaven and earth. Does he forgive sins? Yes. Well, as a yeah. matter of fact, that's a good point to go from. So when you're done with this point, I want to I want to take it to somewhere where we can kind of look at it from a different lens. Same subject matter. Look, I, can, I can go all over I, I, all kind of directions. Let's go to Isaiah. The thing is, oh, but I'll say he has all authority in heaven and earth and he forgives sins. And Jesus says, come to me. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I will give you rest back to 11, 28. And he also says, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. John 14, 14. So shouldn't you go to Jesus and ask him to forgive you of all of your sins? Don't. This, this is crazy. Um, it, it's just crazy hearing it from this point. I don't want to gaslight you and make you feel like it's all right. I'm saying that you are. But just the idea that because Jesus can forgive sins means that he is God is crazy because we're given the ability to forgive. Nope. Yes, we are. We can't forgive sins in the capacity that God has, but the same way that we have power over life and death, we can give life by forgiving. 
and it's crazy that it, it's in the law that we have no, no. the ability to forgive our neighbors. In fact, no, 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 no. Different context. Different context. With the weightier matters like mercy and forgiveness, we all have that ability to forgive. Okay, hold but on. You understand? No, 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 no. You're, you're got understanding. Even from the father, I just don't. I don't see how that makes him the father. I didn't say it makes him the father. You don't understand Trinitarianism. So if, I mean, if a man, I understand how one plus one equals one. Two. Okay, so but you don't understand. You don't understand the Trinity. Look, when if if someone across the street murders his neighbor, you can't go over and say, "I forgive you for doing that." It doesn't work like yeah, that. You got to push evil from out of Israel. That's why I say you can't circumvent God. But each of us within our sphere of influence, so let me be clear, within our sphere of influence, just like Christ has a larger sphere of influence, he has control under that. But he cannot negate God, which is why he says he cannot negate the Father, which means that he is not God. He gives that power to God. Really? You think so? Yeah, absolutely. I can go, I can go in so many different ways. If, Christ, okay. if God is Christ Elohim, that makes him his authority. Uh, if, does he, he have the authority to forgive sins? From the Theos Theon uh, perspective. Does, yeah, be careful. That's, you just uh, did Theos nominative singular and Theon, which is accuser of singular. So um, does Jesus have all the authority in heaven and earth? Yes. Does he say, come to me? Yes. Well, Are you obeying? Hold on. Are you obeying Jesus and coming to him and asking him to forgive you of all of the sins you've ever committed against God? Yes, I asked for forgiveness in the name. I didn't of ask. Oh, yes, it's asking Jesus to do it. I ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. No, I didn't say that. I said asking Jesus. Jesus says, come to me. All who are heavy laden, ask me anything in my name. I will do it. And Stephen prayed to Jesus in Acts 7, 35 You just 16. told me that Jesus said to do what I just said I do. I ask for forgiveness here's, in the name of Jesus. Okay, here's the thing. I've talked to, I don't know how long you, okay, you know, if you know what I do, but I've been doing this for 43 years. I've talked to thousands and thousands and thousands of people, and you're doing something very, very common. I'll say something and you don't hear it. And the reason is, I believe, is because you're so entrenched in your theology, you can't hear it. But try it again. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, whether it was given or not or what, all authority, he has it. He forgives sins. Luke 5, 27, 48. He forgives sins. All right. Jesus says, ask me anything in my name and I will do it. Stephen prayed to Jesus in Acts 7, 55 through 60. Okay. I can show you other verses like this about Jesus. And he says, come to me. So if, and the father says, listen to Jesus, hear him. That's Matthew 3, 16. Here, here's the thing. If Jesus, if the Father tells us to listen to Jesus, Jesus says, come to me, and Jesus can forgive all sins, then shouldn't you go to the one who has all the authority and ask him to forgive you of all of your sins? Shouldn't you? Shouldn't you go to Jesus and ask him? If that's what he said. Yeah. It is what he said. Come to me, all who are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Matthew 11, 28. Uh -huh. Okay, here's something else. I'll show you something. You, but you, didn't you also bring up the scripture where he says, in my name? Yeah, go to John 14, 14. But the problem is you're using the King James. I mean, you, you, I'm, I'm going off of what you quoted. I wasn't reading along with you. So what, what yeah. do you prefer to read? I would say read that one. A NASB is better than the King James. Okay, that's fantastic. If you read from that verse in that translation, what does that one say? I can read the Greek to you if you want and translate it for you. But what it says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Ask him anything in his name? Uh-huh. Hey, Christ, in your name? Ask Jesus anything in Jesus his name. Christ, in your name? Ask it. You come to Jesus, Jesus says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Let, uh, can you give me that verse again? John 14, 14, but the King James doesn't have the word me in it because it's using fifth century documents instead of second and third. And so yeah, it's later. Saying. Yes, I know. And so that's why you want to use an older version. The King James will lead you astray. I'm just I'm just trying to look at it with you. Uh, John 14 and 14, you said. I'm just mm -hmm. going to read it along with you, mm -hmm. if that's okay. Yeah.
Здесь на сайте. I gotta pull this up somewhere. Uh, what I can do is I can share the screen and share the Bible app with you, and you can see it. I'll do King James. I'll you know do different ones. That a problem? You can do that. I'm trying to look at the um, script. And I can show you the Greek too. You could do that. That would be great. Okay. This is taking too long. All right. So hold on. Let me share the screen. Okay. So let's see. Uh, let's see. Present. Share screen. Uh, window. I believe that will be it right there. And then I add. And uh, can you see the screen? Oh, one second. Is it big enough? The text big enough? Hey, could you yeah, turn? Exactly. That's perfect. Okay, could you, Charlie? Could you turn the banner off? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, so good. Yeah, okay. I didn't know the one was on. That's all right. Uh, so, so if you'll notice, yeah. Ash. I guess I'm going to call you Ash. If that, I hope I'm pronouncing that's it right. Perfect. It's perfect. Good. So, look at what it says right here in the King James. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. And you go down here, and uh, it says, "Kaihatian autesete and mu and mu to anamati." Okay. So, you ask me anything in my name. That's what it is. Okay. And so, that's that. If you go to the NASB and the very same verse. The word me is is there in the Greek. The King okay. James, it's not. This is significant. The reason it's significant, it, now the King James is a good Bible. However, it was translated with 5th and 6th century documents. Since the King James has been translated, they found many, many older documents. The, and the rule of thumb is the older the document, the better it is. Now, that's not to say we can't trust the Bibles, but it's just saying in this area, the better manuscripts have me in there. I'm just telling you. And I can show you, if you want, I can show you two other places where the King James translates the Greek wrong. So, wrong. so real quick, um, can you read verse... 15 through 16. Yeah, if, you love me, if you love me, I'll keep my commandments. I will ask the Father. He will give another helper that he may be with you forever. Yep. It, it seems like we're, we're looking at a scenario where there's intercession or mediation going on there. It uh -huh. just doesn't tell me that he has authority where he can just decide to do whatever he wants to do still. So, like, I, I, see, I see what you read. It says, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. But we clearly see that there's things that God still has to do and Jesus has to pray for him in order to do so. Okay. So it, it's still not as cohesive as you're making it seem to be. Who's doing the forgiving when you ask? Jesus is doing forgiving, of course. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, if I sin against you, if I call you names and I get mad at you and I, I hang up and the whole bit, and then let's just say on Monday we talk again, I say, dude, look, man, I'm sorry. I was out of line. I, you know, blah, blah, blah. I have to go to you and ask you for forgiveness because I offended you. It was wrong. I don't know. Huh? And then he has to turn and advocate, though. So what is who does he advocate to? No, no, no I'm trying to say, look, the one who is sinned against is the one we go to. How is it that Jesus can forgive sins? So or, again, he by by advocating. He's not the one sinned against. How is he forgiving? He's doing the act of forgiving. Okay. Watch this. It says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. And it says that that individual is Jesus Christ. So that's what I'm saying is that that forgiveness, it comes through him advocating on our behalf, not as him just saying your sins are gone. He's given the power to do so. Good. He's given the power to do so, to be our advocate, to be the one who forgives us. So shouldn't you go to him like the Father said, listen to him. Jesus says, come to me. Why aren't you doing that? I, I don't get why you're saying I don't. In this in this particular sense, I do. I ask for forgiveness when I need forgiveness in the name of Jesus. 
I Jesus. vocalize when I pray that he is my advocate, that he is my savior, that he died for my sins. I don't get the difference there. Okay, I'll show you something here in text, okay? All right. Psalm, one, Psalm 116. Yeah, I, said there was a place I wanted to go, so I just want you to let me know when we could do that. When what? I said there was a place that I wanted to go. I just want you to let me know when we could do that. Okay, that's okay good. Let me show you something right here, okay? Right here, they called upon the name of the Lord. Oh, Lord, I beseech you, save my life. You see this? I'm going to show you something. Mm -hmm. Okay? The word Lord here is Yahweh. Okay? That's the name of God, right? Mm -hmm. See the phrase, call upon the name of, it's actually Yahweh, okay? I wish the Hebrew, the Bibles would put it in Yahweh, yote bate I wish they would, but at any rate. Then I called upon the name of Yahweh, I, oh, Yahweh, I beseech you, save my life. So the phrase, to call upon the name of Yahweh, is addressed only to God Almighty, and it has to do with prayer and worship and adoration, right? Uh -huh. You sure? I'm following you. I'm going to trap you. I'm going to. I'm going to tell you up ahead. I'm going to try and trap you on something. Okay. That's all right. my attempt. It's not malicious. All right. Now, when we go to the Septuagint, the Septuagint has this phrase. If you look on the screen, I can show it to you. Okay. The Septuagint. Oh, there's. there's oh, there. It's numbered wrong. Uh, that's how, some Septuagints are like that. Uh, yeah, it doesn't have it in there. Like, this is a different rendering of that. So look, here's the thing. You, do you know what the Septuagint is? Yeah, I do. Okay. When they translated the phrase, call upon the name of Yahweh, they translated it into the Greek, call upon the name of the Lord, ha Kurias. That's what they did. And so okay. that phrase, call upon the name of the Lord, not the word, call not the word name but the phrase call upon the name of yahweh is equivalent in the greek call upon the name of the lord that phrase is only of god almighty period only of god almighty right that's right and watch this To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus. And you can see this phrase to call on the name of the Lord Jesus. Why would Paul the Apostle use a phrase, a Greek phrase from the Septuagint, that is only in reference to God Almighty, why would you apply it to Jesus? He's talking about the word Lord in the Greek. Call The phrase, call upon the name of the Lord. The phrase is a reference to Curious. prayer, worship, adoration to God Almighty. The Curious. Jews... No, the Jew, the call upon the name of, of Yahweh. The Jews translated it into the Greek, call upon the name of the Lord. That's what this phrase is. Call upon the name of the Lord. See, what, what, what I'm saying is in that text that you just went to, not the one in the Septuagint, the one where you're saying they're calling Jesus, are you saying that they're calling him Curios? Is that what the hangup is? The phrase, no, they, no. Paul the apostle is saying to the church that calls on the name of the Lord, Jesus. Okay. And Why is Paul? To say is what's your what's your point? What's the discrepancy that I'm supposed to be dealing with? <laughs> Why is Paul the apostle using that phrase right there, which I've got it highlighted? That phrase, "Call on the name of the Lord," is a phrase used only of God Almighty. Why is it in reference to Jesus? Okay, so to the church of God, which is at current, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus saints by calling with all who in every place call on the name of our lord jesus christ mm -hmm. their lord and ours why not he's the king he's but our the, savior the phrase call upon the name of the lord is of god almighty is it yes well, it's, it's, it just says curios i don't i don't you're you're saying because in the Septuagint, it says "curios" in this verse that it means the name of God Almighty. Okay. I, don't, I don't get that. Why isn't it Yahweh? What's the, what's the Greek equivalent? The, this is it's, it's Hebrew it's, right here on the left. 
That's the um, Hebrew. Right. Okay? And I call on the name of the Lord. Okay. In the Hebrew, it's called the name of Yahweh. Uh, That's what it is in the Hebrew. The Jews, when they translated the Old Testament, this phrase occurs here in other places. They f translated it into the Greek, call upon the name of the Greek, the Lord, ha kurios. This says kurios both times is what you're saying. Yeah, kurios is the word for Lord in so Hebrew says, Greek. It says kurios, o oh, kurios, I beseech you, gracious is kurios. No, 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 no. So what does then it I say go, in those other incidences? Read, look right here. Read, look what, read all the way to five. Look what it says. Yeah. Then I called on the name of the Lord. Oh Lord, I beseech you, save my life. Uh, That's what read, it, read it in the Greek all the way to five. How many times does curios come up? It just comes up twice. It just comes up twice. What about in five? I'm just I'm oh, trying to oh, see. Oh, I'm sorry. In five, in five also gracious is yeah, the I Lord. can't analyze yeah. it the way that you are. That's all right. So the word is it's Yahweh that occurs. But look, the phrase, then I called on the name of Yahweh. And then this is how he did it. Oh, Yahweh, I beseech you, save my life. So, so it's what's a prayer? The, what's the word for Lord in verse five? It's uh, Yahweh. Okay. I don't think you have a, much of a point there. There, I, I think that I think that, I think that might be more political than anything else. But you know, I can research that on my own. I can admit you showed me something very interesting to look into. But it still doesn't change my view. Like it still, it still looks like you're hoping for Christ to advocate on your behalf in each of the instances that you pulled up. So what I'll do is I'll write this down to look at it, and then we can revisit it again when we revisit the other scriptures that you had no adequate answer for that I asked you about. But I want to also ooh ooh ooh, ooh. <laughs> no adequate answer. So now I can say to you, you have no adequate answer for what I just brought up to you, and, yeah, I, and that's, not, that's the easy stuff. Fine. That's perfectly oh, you gotta, fine. You got to be nice now. Come on now. I mean, I'm I'm saying I want more. So if you're wanting for more out of something, then what you are getting out of it is inadequate. So there would be no need for another discussion. <laughs> not a slight. But in that same that same time frame, we could revisit these things again. But I want to look at Isaiah the sixth chapter, if if we could we'll go there. Then I'm gonna get going because I got to tend to my wife and stuff. Okay, that sounds good. Six. Thank you for all that extra time too. This is right. good. This has been better than any other dialogue I've had. Well, good. <clears throat> Isaiah 6, what? Uh, we can start at verse 1. Okay, let me, hold on. Let me get over to my notes. I want to put this in here. Okay. All right. <clears throat> I could send you all my notes, not all, but the notes on the scriptures and say, here's what BHI have brought up. Why? And you can say, this is why. Proves this and proves that. Okay, so... Isaiah 6, 1 and 2? Um, st let's start at verse 1. If, okay. All right. And go ahead. And what's it about? What's the, I want to know the point too. So it's a vision that Isaiah is having. having okay. And it's, it's, it's an important vision to me because, well, you'll see why. Do you, is it okay if I read it? I can sure. see it. Sure. It says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord. And I'm sure you and I would both agree that's talking about Yahweh sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted. So that's the most high. That's the creator of heaven and earth sitting on his throne with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two, he covered his face and with two, he covered his feet and with two, he flew. And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filled with smoke. I'm going to get to the point here. Um, if you could scroll down just a little bit, we're going to read all the way up until verse seven. There you go. Um, it says, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So again, he's isolating the Most High 
All right. Now, in verse six, it says, then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. And he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sins forgiven. Who does this seraphim signify in your opinion? I don't know. <clears throat> okay. Any other serpentine um, creatures likened under Christ in the, in the Torah that you can think of? Well, you know, the devil, obviously, but yeah. What about the serpent in the wilderness? Because we talked about uh, John 3, 16 and how the context starts at 14 more so. I'd say start a little higher would be even better. But um, John 3 and 14 talks about the serpent that was raised up in the wilderness on a staff by Moses and right. he the Israelites and saved them. Right. So I'm saying that this is something that's pretty common when referring to Christ. There's also a prophecy that talks about how uh, a serpent was going to come from the loins of David, essentially. And I believe uh, Isaiah, the 14th chapter, but I don't want to digress. Um, it says that he touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sins is forgiven. Um, Christ is given the authority to forgive sins, right? Or was there someone who had that authority before him? Uh, I wouldn't say that he had the authority there. It doesn't say he had the authority. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that, um, that we grab that because when you look at the book of, I believe, Numbers, there's a foreshadowing of Christ being lifted up as a serpent in the wilderness and saving the Israelites. Maybe that's something that we can revisit in our future dialogue. Sure. But then you have to be able to analyze why would he take a hot coal? What's the coal represent? Where's the furnace? Tongs and put on lips and that's what forgave him? No, something else is going there. Going yeah, it's very, I don't, I don't think it's about uh, the coal. I think it signifies something different. But what I'm looking at is the real conduit there is the, the serpent. Well, uh, the serpent, the seraphim is a serpent. No, you, you don't, 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 don't make that mistake. Don't what make a mistake. It? Okay. A seraphim is a type of angel. There's cherubim, seraphim, archangels, oh. powers, principalities. Uh, it's a supernatural being, but don't just say it's a serpent. Okay. It's a different word. So that would be not good. So did, or, do you admit, though, that he saw Yahweh? I, one, I want to be very clear. It, it is a serpent, whether it's of an angelic sort or not. The word uh, seraph, it's talking about a fiery serpent, a poisonous, fiery serpent. And so that is the, the point that I'm coming from. And I don't want that to be lost on anybody who might listen to this in the future. Yeah, you got to be careful what's called illegitimate totality transfer. What that means is a single word can have multiple meanings in different contexts. A single person can learn the entire vocabulary of Hebrew as it was spoken back then, but not so with Greek. It's too vast of a language, unless you're, a, you know, idiot savant, you know. Yeah, like if you look at an im, that could just mean, that's going to mean plural. But if you look at an im, that's going to be more so of a duality. I understand that. But when so, I look at it, I'm just saying that seraphim has been used as a fiery serpent three times, fiery twice, seraphim twice, serpent, fiery serpent, poisonous serpent, majestic beings with six wings, uh, human hands or voices. So it has different meanings. So you got to be careful not, not to take a meaning over one place and transfer it to here because here they have wings. Serpents don't have wings. So look. Here's Love the thing I want to ask you. You said, did did uh, did Isaiah actually see Yahweh? Um, this is a, this is a vision, and it says that he sees the Lord in this vision. Nobody's actually going to see the Most High face to face. Are you sure? Except Moses. Moses, Numbers twelve six through eight, he beholds the form of Yahweh. So did Moses actually see Yahweh? Um, he saw his back physically. That's Exodus thirty twenty thirty three twenty. Um, See, you know, you can't see my face for no man can see me and live. Exodus 33, 11, 11 and then 33, 20 saw the, you know, the backside. But right. how about this? Let me show you something. Okay. I'm just yeah, curious. Before you move on, 
what I was trying to pose with that text was what I want you to be able to explain to me when we talk again, if at all possible, is why is that serpent juxtaposed from the most high? And that is with my understanding that that serpent represents Christ. Why are they not one and the same? Are you, you would have to kind of oh. tell me all of those seraphims are different aspects of the most high. Okay, so you're saying the seraphim slash serpent represented who? Jesus. Christ. Okay. okay. Um, well, then what does the coal represent? Picked up with Tom. Um, I, I, I actually don't have a, a thesis on what that coal is very specifically. So, you know, I'm, welcome, I'm welcoming what? your answer. Why touch his lips when it touches heart where his sin is? Um, men are defiled by what they speak. I don't know. I don't want to uh, okay. impose my ideas. I'd rather pull it from the text. Yeah. So, again, but then how do they, yeah, that'd be, that'd be but cool. Then out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, Matthew 12, 34. So, yeah, it's tough to, uh, to, to do that because there's so much symbolism there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so I got my notes there. He said the serpent's, uh, rep uh, seraphim serpent represents Jesus. Okay. So look at this verse here. Oh, yeah, yeah. My wife, oh, she hasn't called me yet. God spoke further to Moses, said to him, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. Do you believe that God appeared as God Almighty? Um, Adonai, yeah. I'm sorry? Adonai? No, not Adonai, Yahweh. By the way, I have hearing aids, but I had to turn them in today. They had to be fixed. So I have 80 decibel ringing in both ears. I really do, unfortunately. And my days in the nightclubs blew out. And so it's really loud. I don't have my hearing aids in for a week. While you got to be prepared. You got to so, do a lesson about not going to the club and standing next to the dude, speaker. You got that right. I was a white boy with rhythm, man. I used to hit the clubs all the time. I love it. But it blew my ears out. I was stupid. I had to meet myself and beat myself up from that back in the day. Stop. At any rate, so uh, notice what it says. God spoke further to Moses, said to him, I am Yahweh. That's God talking, uh -huh. identifying himself by his name. I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. So did he appear as God Almighty? You mean, are, are you talking about the name that they knew him by when you asked me that? Or are you saying how he presented himself? Are you saying, did he actually present himself to them? Because I will say no. Look what it says. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I'm Yahweh. So the text says it's God who's talking, mm -hmm. not an angel, not a man, not a vision, not a dream. God and said, I'm Yahweh. So it's God who identifies himself as Yahweh. This right, is right. it. Okay. And you're saying he said, that he presented himself, but not by God, but not by Yahweh, but as God. No. Almighty. Hold on. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Yahweh, I did yeah, not make myself known to them. So yeah, they didn't yeah. know his name. It was God Almighty they were seeing, but they didn't but, know his name yet. That's all. So do you so agree you that they saw he presented himself and that would indicate them seeing him? Is that the point you're making? That's what I, that's what God says. OK, I don't I don't read it that way, because when I look at how Moses was presented with the word, he met I am that I am. And then he juxtaposed himself and then said that, tell them that Yahweh sent you. And when when you read it, it says an angel appeared, a messenger. So I believe that the most high speaks to people through messengers most of the time. OK, so, so is, in this particular is, instance here, it would have been the same thing. Is it they, so when God when it says God was speaking, it really wasn't God speaking? Right. When he it's it's like uh it's like T Mobile speaking to you. You're not talking to T Mobile, you're speaking to representatives of T Mobile because it's an overarching entity, but it has representatives. So the most high, if we can't comprehend him and look upon him, he's gonna have okay. emissaries come on his behalf. That's that's the way I read it. Okay, so when it says God spoke further to Moses, it really wasn't God speaking. And when he says, I am Yahweh, it really wasn't Yahweh. Let, let's, let's be clear, because the way, this is the way I respect God, right? If God sends an angel and the angel says, thus saith the Lord, that's just as good as the Lord speaking to me. That's how I respect it. So I believe God is speaking and they're not going to speak anything other than what he said. But do I believe that I'm looking at the most high? No, absolutely not. Well, the text says 
God spoke further to Moses. I'm going to conclude that it was God who spoke to Moses because mm -hmm. it says God spoke to Moses. So I think it's God who spoke to Moses. Mm -hmm. Is that unreasonable? I'm, I, I would say it's, it's, it's unreasonable for me. Why? Because when God said, I'm going to make you gods to the Egyptians, it didn't mean I was going to make you God the most high to the Egyptians. When the people who were running to and fro when the Israelites were making their way through the wilderness and they said, these are the gods that destroyed the Egyptians. I don't take that as this is Yahweh who destroyed the Egyptians, although we would represent him in some capacity. So, so no, it's not very reasonable to me. That's a different context. And you got to make sure you don't look at some other context and interpret this by something else because we could reverse it. And I mean, have you I think any context matters, but what I'm looking at is that there's a word here being used, um, Yahweh. And there's words used, God. And depending on who you talk to, people think when you see God, you're talking about one very particular entity. So I'm saying that I don't really make the mistake of doing that. I see scriptures that indicate that an angel is speaking. So I'm going to believe that the angel is speaking when it says, thus saith the Lord. If we're looking look, at Moses, look at talking this. To angel, for example, when Abraham was 99 years old, Yahweh appeared to Abraham and said, I am God almighty. Walk before me. So it says that God almighty appeared. And this says God spoke for the Moses said, I'm Yahweh. I appeared to to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. That's not an angel. Because an angel wouldn't say, I'm Yahweh. That would not be true. You see? Hold on real quick. I'm trying to pull my tools up and in like manner. And I'm having some technical difficulties. So just one second. So you and I both agree that Hebrew words can be used in different forms until we get to scriptures that you feel very strongly about, like the Hebrew word, um, the root of ra'ah, where when you appear, it could be to appear could be figuratively as well. So like why like why do you have the bias here? Like what 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 other sources do you have that could further point me to where this is not figurative and that it, it's read uh, the context okay well what about the context this, right there now when abram was 99 years old yahweh mm -hmm. appeared to abram and said to him i'm god almighty walk before me be blameless i will establish my covenant between me and you and i'll multiply you exceedingly abraham fell on his face and god talked with him saying as for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and all the father, you be the father of multiple nations, etc. Mm -hmm. So says, I'll establish my covenant, etc. God said to further further to him, Now, as for you, you shall keep my commandments, my covenant, right? <clears throat> and then the then the uh, thing, the uh, circumcision issue. God said to Abram, As for Sarah, your wife, so God's just talking the whole time. And check this out. We go down to 18:1. Now that Yahweh appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre. And incidentally, this is Bragg. I was there a few months ago, right there where this happened. Uh, while he was sitting at the tent door of the day, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, three men were standing opposite him. Now, this says Yahweh appeared, and three are there. Interesting. Which really, really, really interesting. So, so that so, would be figurative, right? Is it? Because Yahweh means what? He be, or he exists. No, I am. Yeah, no, Ahaya means I am. Yahweh means he exists or the existing one. You, I'll go with that. I'll go with that, okay? Like if, if we the, the even being one, if right? we could. in Greek, the being one, the existing one. So there you go. That's fine. That's his name. He said that's his name in, in right. Exodus 315, okay? So God spoke to him. God appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, check this out. Look at this. In Exodus uh, 24, 9. Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and they went up, uh, and they saw the God of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. And under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphires, clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the sons of the nobles of Israel. They beheld God, they ate and they drank, or they saw God, they ate and they drank. 
Check this out really fast. I have a reason for showing you this. This is Acts 7, I believe it's verse 2. And Stephen says, here, brethren and fathers, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Stephen, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says he appeared. Right there in Acts 7, verse 2. What's the Hebrew God's word? I mean, sorry, what, what Hebrew word do you think that's adjacent to? This is Greek. Oh, I'm Acts. saying what, what Hebrew word do you think that is adjacent to? Like some to a Hebrew word. Okay. You know how some things can be lost in translation in Greek versus Hebrew? Some cases, it's not necessarily like that. Some cases, there is an adequate, like you have the different variations of the word Jerusalem. So is there any source on what that Hebrew word is? I mean, what Greek word is adjacent yeah. to in Hebrew? Optomani. Optomani. Uh, optonomai. Is the Greek word. Yes, to see, perceive with the eyes, to look at, uh, right there. Yeah. Okay, and but this is no, what, what I'm saying is: is, is there no source on what Hebrew word that Greek word is adjacent to? I was just asking you that. Not subject. because this isn't a quote from the Hebrew. This is here. This is Thomas. Excuse me, Stephen, simply speaking, and he said, "The glory of the God of glory appeared." to our father Abraham. One of the nice things about this program I have is it's 3,700. That's so the Greek word. I can go this, over here This is do this. Real, real quick, before you go too much further, the, the, the issue that I take is this. There was an oral tradition in Israel just as much as there was paper going around. You got the Sadducees who more so dealt with the paper. You got the um, Pharisees who more so dealt with what was going on with the oral tradition and they were astute in what was going to be documented as well. But with oral tradition, you're going to get different language that's being used passed down through generation to generations. So you're looking at things like semantic change. You're looking at things like words becoming lost in translation. So why here are we seeing God appear to our father Abraham one way where in the Hebrew it says it could be figuratively. I, I asked you about that one text. What within the text tells you that the Lord appearing is not figuratively? You proceeded to tell me what the Lord said, but you didn't give me any other indicator linguistically. Um, you didn't give me any other type of background of that text. It's just my word against yours on how that's read in that instance. Does that make sense what I'm asking you? Yeah, yeah, it does. But okay. Because, like, this is, I'm not being disrespectful when I say no, this. No, not at all. Not but at all. what I never wanted to be is I'm older, so I'm right. I'm younger, so I'm right. I'm white, and I'm right. I'm black, and I'm right. So what is going to divide that for me is facts. And the facts is we both read the same text, and you and I are both saying it looks different based off of other background issues. So before, what I do uh -huh. is read it. Okay. God spoke to Moses. So I'm, I believe it was God who spoke to Moses because the text said God spoke to Moses. Or angels are called God. But we're not looking at an angel here because he says, I am Yahweh. Is an angel going to say I am Yahweh? If, uh, if an angel speaks on behalf of the Lord, again, we're circling back to that issue, and that's fine with me. But I feel like we're missing each other on that. If no, an angel not. comes to somebody and has nothing to say but what the Lord said, why are they not just going to say what the Lord said? Okay. This is what the Lord an angel, has to say. An angel could appear and say, thus says the Lord, and uh -huh. then quote what the Lord says. That's not happening here. Okay. I've seen here. prophets do that, but I've seen plenty of instances where it says there's an angel, and it says, thus, this is what the Lord is saying. If we there look you go. Up, exactly. And the angel will say, this is what he has said. It thus says the Lord, blah, 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 blah. That's not happening here. God spoke to Moses and said, I am Yahweh. That's God. That's not an angel speaking for God. So when the angel appeared to Moses, what did, what was the angel there for? Okay, that's different. What, well, let's talk about it then. No, 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 no. Right here in Exodus 6, 
Exodus 3 is different because angel could simply mean messenger, doesn't necessarily mean created being. Because right. in the Trinity, it could be the pre-incarnate Christ who's doing the work of being the mediator and the intercessor back then, just as he was in the garden. Right. And I can show you that. I can show you all kinds of stuff like that. But let me show you why I'm, I'm showing this to you. Why I'm doing this. Because your theology is insufficient. I'm trying to show you something. This is what Jesus says in John 6, 46. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who's from God, he has seen the Father. He talked about himself, right? Okay. Who are they seeing in the Old Testament who claims to be God, Yahweh, who's God Almighty, but not God the Father? I'm sorry, uh, disassociated. What, what was that you just said? Jesus said, not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one, talking about himself, uh -huh. he has seen the Father. All right? Good. So Jesus seen the Father. So no one else has. In the Old Testament, God says, he speaks, not an angel, it's God. So he appears. In fact, he says, as you brought up, God appeared to Moses, and it, that's a num number 12, 6 through 8. Hear now my words. If there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision or a dream, and not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my, all my household. With him I speak openly and not in dark sayings. And he beholds the form of Yahweh. That's what God said. That's not an angel. In Exodus 24, 9 through 11, 74 people see the God of Israel. In Genesis 17, 1 and, Ex and Genesis 18, 1, God appears. This is what it says. But Jesus says, no one's ever seen the Father. And yet God himself says, I am Yahweh. I appeared to him as that God Almighty. I appeared to them. This is what God is saying. Oh, so here's the, here's the question. Who is God Almighty in the Old Testament who's not God the Father? Um, God Almighty and the Father are the same person. But Jesus says no one's ever seen the Father. They were seeing God Almighty, but they weren't seeing God the Father. So who were they I, seeing? I, again, I, they see? I believe that he's figuratively appearing. in this, And I'm going to use this same instance again. I know you're saying it's a separate context, but it's a good it's a good thing to look at and examine how that can work. And it's, again, it's Exodus 3 and 2. I know you're saying there's a different situation. But it works very perfectly. It says the angel of the Lord, that the messenger of Yahweh. Right? So being very specific here, when we see the word angel, we're looking at Malak angel. We're talking about the same thing across the board, I'm sure. It says the messenger of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he yep. looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, which was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out unto him in the midst of the bush. That's why I asked what the angel was there to do. Was the angel just there? Or was, the angel, or was the angel representing the Lord and speaking on his behalf? Oh, I let's look at it. Angel is speaking on the behalf. angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the midst of the bush, right? Mm -hmm. And then it says, um, <clears throat> when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, to look at what? God to called. look at the burning bush where the angel of the Lord is, right? And the so Lord when, saw. And hold, God. Wait, hold on. When he saw that that Moses is looking at the, at the place where the angel is, he's seeing the fire. Uh -huh. Then God called to him. Uh -huh. And spoke is, out of the midst of the bush. Yes. Is God the angel? Uh, angels, that's what I'm saying. Angels are called God. Is God the angel? That's not my question. <laughs> Elohim is a plural word. So the application. Can yeah, be Trinity. Bad. You got is, L. Is, you're not answering you the question. You got L, that's singular, but it's not no. talking about L. This is Elohim. Is God an angel? No. Okay. So it says the angel, angel, but an the angel, angel can be called God. The angel of Yahweh, is that Yahweh himself? No, absolutely not. No. The when it says when Yahweh, verse four, saw that he turned aside to look, God called him. Right. So that's two different parties right here. The angel of the Lord, according to you, the angel of the Lord and God. Two different parties are involved here. And now I, I, we have in verse four, God spoke. I, I disagree that the angel 
and God are juxtaposed. I believe they are right there. You said so. No, 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 no. I, I don't think that they're juxtaposed. I believe that the Lord is juxtaposed. It says a messenger of the Lord. Like, for example, the Lord's not going to send an angel to send a message that he's just going to come and speak right along. Like the angel's going to stand there and God's going to do all the speaking. The angel's there to give what message at that point. So the angel is there to represent the Lord. And that angel is being called God because he is a part of that Elohim. So right? the angel, that's how I look at the text. I don't the see angel, what you see it. The angel activates the burning of the bush. Okay. The angel does that. The, we'll say the angel is a created thing. We'll just go with that for now. Oh, so God okay? creates the burning of the bush. No, it doesn't say that. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of the bush. So God see who did that midst of the angel. Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock of the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire. It doesn't say who started the fire. It just says the bush is on fire. You can't go beyond what's written here. It just says okay. the bush is on fire. And it says the angel of the Lord. You agree? Well, we'll go for this for now. The angel of the Lord is not the same thing as God because it's an angel. Oh, as the, the angel. Lord. Something is the Lord. It's an angel of the Lord. Yes, an angel. The Lord is an angel, right? No, 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 no. What, what, what I said, my stance, because it seemed like you said we agree. My stance is that the angel and God are synonymous, not the angel and the Lord. They are not synonymous. They're not. They're not one in the same. It okay, looks the purpose of an angel. So I, I, I'm seeing where it says the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire. And then when I read down, I see where it says God called out unto him in the midst of the bush, which is that same fire. Then you have a problem from your perspective, okay. because if you're going to say the angel is a created being. And then God is the one who notices that Moses turns to look at the bush because you skip that when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses said, here I am. We have two parties here. God is not an angel. Because by your definition, no, an the angel Lord is not an angel. We, we keep mixing that aspect up. Yeah, but an angel's not God. God's not an angel. We, 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 keep, we keep mixing that up. That's your stance. And I, I follow your stance. I keep saying that the Lord is not an angel. Like, for example, the Lord does not have an, a monopoly on the word Elohim. I don't believe that. I believe that the angels also share in that. Share right? in God? Share in the, the word Elohim. So well, you're not going to see that as the word El, which is the singular. So El you is, and I are missing each other on that, where you're saying, you keep saying that. We're looking here first. God. I don't believe that. We're looking here at the text first. Okay, I'm looking at the same text, and we're is looking the angel, at the word messenger. And is the, I don't, okay, go ahead. Is the angel the Lord actually God? The angel is a God. He is not the Lord. He is so a the angel of God, as it, the text states. Wait, the angel, I, I asked, is the angel of the Lord actually God? So you're you're giving me your stance and you want I'm I'm not going to concede to my point while I'm dealing with your logic. You're saying is the angel actually God? My belief my again my belief is that the angels are to refer to as God. Right? And that's so what they refer you to impose your logic on me. Again, I understand that you believe that God means the Lord, if that's if that's correct, that's fine. But I don't hold that. What I'm saying is that the Lord has a messenger here, and that messenger, that Malak, is being referred to as God. And so when it says that the Lord appears, I my belief is that it appears by way of that angel presenting itself and yielding its vessel for the Most High to speak through, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I understand that, okay. but that's not what I asked. I asked, is a created angel actually God? That's my question. Yes, a, a created angel is actually God. The same way the Israelites are actually God. 
So a created angel is actually God. A created angel is actually God. But the God. created angel is not the father. The created angel is not Yahweh. The created angel is not the Lord. He represents the Lord. Um, yeah, so when someone says that an angel is actually God, that's obviously a problem. Um, but uh, you're I'm saying glad it's that a we... problem, but we can Sorry? read it. I said you're saying it's a problem, but we can actually read it, though. But a, an angel is a created thing. How can a created thing be the non-created thing? Watch, watch this. No, you understand the question. How yeah, can a created I understand thing the question, be, but I feel like you're kind of stuck on an idea that's very... It's not logical not for you to say that. No, how can a created thing also be not the created thing? Watch this. Where, where in the word, where in the word malak does it imply that it's not created? Okay, um, I, I, I'm not talking about that. I'm asking you about this issue of the angel of the Lord. Uh -huh. Is the angel of the Lord an actual created angel? Yeah, I believe okay. all the angels was created. Okay, so a created angel can't actually be the true living God, can he? So you, what you're looking for is, is the angel Yahweh? No, the angel is not Yahweh. Good. So the yeah. angel is not actually Yahweh. It shouldn't right, take right. five minutes for you to agree to that. I mean, we keep yeah. using different words, different ways. No, I keep, I'm we being are, clear. We are, we are. Because I keep being very specific and I keep differentiating God and what that word means from Yahweh himself. And you keep circling back to that word God. So it seems like you're ignoring my stance on what it all means. I'm sure that maybe you're feeling the same way, but here, here's an example of what I'm talking about. If we look at say Exodus seven and one, where, yeah, it, says, God, yes. where it says, Meomer Yahweh El Moshe, Re'e Natatke Elohim, La Pero Waharon. It says, I will make you as God, as Pharaoh, essentially. That doesn't imply that all of a sudden Moses is not created. So that's the stance that I'm coming from is that that word Elohim, um, I think we use it rather loosely and it's applied differently throughout the scriptures. In this same sense, when we look at the book of Exodus that we've been harping on for the past 20 minutes now, that God, the fact that it says God doesn't imply that Yahweh is there in the physical. What's happening in Exodus 7 is God is saying to Mo Moses, I'm going to make you as a God to him because I'm going to do all this stuff through you. That's what I, that's God's, what not saying, God's not saying he actually is a God by nature and by essence. I didn't, didn't say that. I didn't say that. What I'm saying is but that over that here, used but over here, <laughs> but over here, the angel of the Lord, you say that's a created being. I mm -hmm. uh, Let's just go with that for now. And then mm -hmm. it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him. Now, how do you know they're not two different occurrences, two different things being spoken of here? An angel that was in the bush and then God who spoke from the bush. I'm not seeing it, pal. How do you know it's not the angel who activated, for example, potential, he activated the fire. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, but the fire bush was there. The angel was there in that. And the implication is that the angel was the one causing the fire. That's the implication. We can't prove it, but that's the implication. And so it got uh, you said you attention. Can't prove it. Yeah, it's not a logical proof because the text doesn't say that the angel of the Lord started the fire. It, but the implication is that he's the cause of the fire. But we can't prove that that is the case. We can only say it, it seems to be the case, but we don't know for sure. So then we say, okay, so it looks like that the angel started the fire, which got his got uh, Moses attention goes up and when God saw this then God spoke from him inside it was the angels preparing the way for the Lord to be there to do that because fire is a type of judgment and purity so you see you got to be careful you can't just go all the, like Deuteronomy 7 1 God is you know God said I'll make you as a God to Pharaoh it's not the same kind of thing that's going on here because it's it, because God then identifies himself as the God. That's not what Moses is doing. And God's not saying that's going to happen to Moses. That's, God's that's identifying, identifying himself here. That's not my point. I'm saying that God's not saying that he's going to make Moses 
into some not created being. That was my simple point. When you say God and then you say, OK, so this means not created being, you can't just take that and do that. Because, again, the Israelites are called gods, but everybody knows the Israelites are created. But that's that's a different or, context. Or are, but it's the different same context. word. Same word, different context, just like in Exodus where we're reading about the, the angels speaking to Moses out of the bush. That word God being used there is not necessarily saying that Yahweh is there speaking. Okay. That's, that's the only point I'm trying to make. I got you. I got you. Okay. I'm trying to show you the problems sure. with it. I'm trying to show you the problems with it. That's all. I do this a lot, and I encounter people who they can't just go bit by bit, logic point by logic point, and just see what it says. They can't do it. I mean, they have an overarching imposition of theological perspective that must interpret the verse instead of the verse interpreting their theology. That's that. That's a bit of a shot, and I'll take it because I, I like to compete. But if we read it just bit by bit, the implications of what you're saying is that that little that bush that's burning, the angel is sitting there and then God is sitting there on his lap or that angel is there to be a messenger on behalf of God when God is just going to come and speak. Because you're call, you're saying that God means Yahweh. So that no, I, is there for no reason. No, I'm saying there's different possibilities. You have to look at possibilities. Well, there's different possibilities. I'm not necessarily committing a fallacy. You have, you have not proven that your stance is any better than mine. All you've done is express that you're very confident in it, which I appreciate. I'm saying you don't make assumptions too quickly. Look at the text. You look at what it says. For, so for when God spoke to Moses, said, I am Yahweh, God okay. spoke to Moses, said, I'm Yahweh. All I've got to do is read the text and say, that's what it says. Others have to say, it's not what it says. Then they go here to Exodus 3 to interpret it, Exodus 6. But that's a problem. Because in Exodus 3, it's the angel of the Lord is one there and God is another. But they're not the same if you say an angel is created. So now you're saying the angel is representing God. But then why is it God's the one speaking? Mm -hmm. Then it says God called to him. But if you're going to say that it was God who's speaking and it was the angel of the Lord, then you're saying the angel of the Lord is God. But you can't do that from your perspective. You have to do then what you have to do then is say, well, he's using God's name and representing. But that's not what's happening here, especially in Exodus 6. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work. OK, it doesn't work, particularly since in Acts 7, 2, Stephen said that God appeared to him. It did to Moses appeared. And in Exodus 24, 9 through 11, 74 people saw the God of Israel. In Numbers 12, 6 through 8, God says, Moses sees him, his form. But the problem is, if God is saying all of this, and he says, not in dark sayings, not a vision, not a dream, he beholds the form of Yahweh. God says that in, X, in uh, Numbers 12, 6 through 8. If he says that. I look back, I saw Moses was the only one to see the Most High, and he saw his back. So you and I are in agreement on that. What we're talking about is whether or not, at this point, whether or not Moses saw the Most High. If we rewind the footage and watch it again, that's where we got hung up at. What does so, it say right there? So it says, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all mine house. With him, I speak mouth to mouth, even openly and not in dark saying, he beholds the form of the Lord. If, if, if I told you that uh, Moses saw the back of the Most High, that's still looking at his form. So we're not disagreeing with this. What we, what we agree on is that Moses spoke very clearly with the Most High and that he saw the form of the Most High. There's not much of a, a spat between you and I when we look at these three verses. You, the yeah. only thing is that you're taking it a bit further and now you're saying that Moses saw God's face? No, I didn't say that. It okay, says so here, uh, it says, he says, I will speak to him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. I speak to him mouth to mouth. I go with what it says. Okay. He beholds the form of Yahweh. Did Moses behold the form of Yahweh? I'm going to say it for the third time that Moses saw the Most High's back. That's not what it says here. It says the form. If I, if you see my back, you're going to see the form of me. No, that's Exodus 33, 20. It's a completely different book and completely different context. Right here, he says, not in dark sayings, not in a vision, not a dream. He beholds the form. Did Moses behold the form of the Lord? 
I'm going to I'm going to keep on agreeing with you on that. But we're going to keep disagreeing about what that means. And I don't, it's, I don't understand why we're going in this loop. But um, yeah, again, I, I still agree with you. OK. And so they see God. But it's not the father. Who are they seeing in the Old Testament who's God, but not the Father? Who is the one when it says a call upon the name of Yahweh and the phrase is applied to Jesus? And in Hebrews 1 8, God says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. Jesus is prayed to, He's worshiped, He's called God. He has all authority in heaven and earth. He indwells us, He knows our hearts. He knows our minds. He has all of this ability. Because so, otherwise, you'd be committing idolatry to agree with that if you say he's not God. You'd be, contrib you'd be attributing to created thing the attributes that belong to God. Uh -huh. So I'm following you. But we, us disagreeing about the form of God, that, that, that stuck out to me and it took a minute to click in my head. Like what? What do you think that means? If you could just sum it up real quick, what's the form? I don't know. I just know it's what it says. So if the if a Hebrew dictionary says that it's the likeness, um, something portioned out, something that has been given the attributes of, um, a representation of, would you concede to your point that that? means that definitively Moses saw God face to face? Well, I know he did because it says so in Exodus 24, 9 to 11, where it says they saw the God of I'm Israel. Sure you can see that point in Numbers 12. Like well, you, can, you can find another text that says it if you, if you can. I would yield to it. But when you look at Numbers 12, it's not saying what you're saying. It's saying it says that the likeness, Moses saw the likeness of the Most High. Good. What does it mean to see the likeness of God himself? Um, a likeness is something that's likened unto something else, okay. like like unto a man. So it's not necessarily that you're seeing that thing, but more specifically, it says that this is something that is portioned out or fashioned out in the shape of. So giving that to Yahweh, it says that he beheld something that was given the shape of Yahweh or a similitude. He he saw something that was more like an image of, there like a icon. For example, if we look at the Greek, right, which doesn't dictate Yahweh himself, but um, it would be a representation because all manifestations of God would be some form of representation. Is a is an angel a representation? No, an angel is a created being from the context. That, we're talking no, 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 no. What what is a messenger? What does an angel do? Conveys information. Is it is it representative of the of the person who they are getting the information from? In that sense, yeah. OK, so that is a meaning of it. So we have to say yes. We can't just say no and throw that that idea out. The reason why I'm doing that is because logically you and I will both yield to the fact that an angel is a representative. And if we do that and we see that Moses has seen a representative of Yahweh, then we both agree to the point that the most high is saw an angel who could be looked at as a form of Yahweh. Oh, OK. Then you would agree then when a representative says, I'm Yahweh, that that's a problem. Well, no, I don't see it as a problem. Because so look, if a, Hold on. If a representative says, I'm Yahweh, is that true or not true? I believe it's true. Because if those so angels, is, when a representative who's not Yahweh says he is Yahweh, then it's, that's not true. OK, this is this is uh, this is going to because we're going to just go back and forth on this. Who's accredited for who, for destroying the firstborn of Egypt? God. Right? Yahweh? Are there yeah, any the scriptures that say Yahweh did it? Yeah. Okay. And then in, are there any other instances in the text where it says that an angel went yeah. past through Egypt and destroyed the Egyptian? Uh -huh. That's right. So you and I can agree how an angel is used. An angel is a vessel for the Most High's will. And is it, is it a lie in the text? That it says Yahweh did it? No, because it's Yahweh who gets the glory every time. Yes, but you always got to read the context. You always read what's happening. When it says an angel of God did it, that's fine. When God is sending them to do it, 
then it's by the ultimate hand of God. So but an angel, Exodus, angel would indicate, messenger would indicate that it's being sent by the person with the message. So in any context, an angel is just an angel if you're going to measure it against the creator of heaven and earth, right? Yes, but there's another possibility you've not entertained. Okay. What would that be? If the Trinity is true, the angel of the Lord would be the second person of the Trinity who's carrying out the work and thereby saying the angel, the messenger, who would be the second person, the pre-incarnate Christ, is God and God would both do the same thing and then both would be true equally. Which is why it's going to be very interesting um, to hear your exegesis of Isaiah, the sixth chapter, because you have to prove that there's only three angels. No, I don't have to prove that for three angels. Yeah, you do. Tell you what. You no, do, I don't. Because we know there's a multitude of angels up there in the heaven, right? No, no, no. It, it, it's not a restriction. That it has to be three angels or five or whatever in the context. You said, it, you said that would indicate that that's the third person in the Trinity. No, no, no. I didn't why, say that. Why, I didn't why? say that. No, 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 no. That's not what I said. No, I said in the context of the angel of the Lord, the angel of death coming through and carrying out the execution, that it, it is a possibility that the second person of the Trinity who can be our messenger because the person in, in the garden of who walked with Adam and Eve was the Lord, but they, they saw him. They were with him. And it's oh, not the father. Okay, it wasn't an angel. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree it wasn't. I agree that it wasn't. Um, wait, I spoke too quick. And I'm, I'm overexcited. But this has been entertaining. Um, and to be honest, I appreciate the decorum. But I don't I don't think that that was the Lord walking in the garden. That's well, what, says, I, what I meant says, to say. So they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the it said garden. the voice of the Lord. What's that? It said the voice of the Lord. Uh, let's see. Uh, Day that the Lord made heaven and earth. Let's see. Uh, Lord formed them uh, on the ground. Come on, let's get to chapter three. So, Lord caused a deep sleep. Uh, Lord caused a fashion of woman. They heard. Wait, I'm going to look for the word heard. Let's do it that way. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. Mm. Okay. And a man. Now, technically, I'm going to just be, be straight with you. Um, I don't see where it says that they saw him. Okay. But it says they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden of the cool of the day. Mm -hmm. so, so he's walking. It's called mm -hmm. a, an anthropomorphism. Mm -hmm. And the man and his wife hid themselves. And the Lord God called to the man and said, where are you? And he said, I was naked. Who told you were naked? The man said, et cetera. The Lord said to the serpent. So it looks like they're talking to each other and they're seeing each other. It looks like it, but not necessarily. This is an issue of logic. It could be that they heard sound and they just hid themselves and their voice is just kind of emanating. It's possible. And so we don't know. I like to be as strict to the text as possible as I can. But at the very least, the sound of the Lord is walking. And there you go. I believe it was a pre-incarnate Christ who was existing but let me ask you really quickly before we go i do need to go i have to use the restroom for, for one thing i gotta go to the restroom i've been drinking stuff and coffee and uh i gotta check out my wife too okay but um, yeah same i I'm, I'm right there with you on that um i wanted to analyze the the same text where we're talking about um with the voice of the lord but i, I will hear your point yeah it's gonna be the sound of the voice because uh but anyway, uh, I'm starting. I'm starting to get to the point now where I <laughs> gotta go. So I'm not thinking as clearly as I'd like to. So I tell you what we'll do. You email me the stuff, and I'll put my. You know my email address. Do you know my website, karm.org? Um, no. Nah. Okay. All right. Well, okay. I did give you my email, so if you reach out, I'll be able to reply very clearly. Okay. Um, well, look. Here's here's. Here it is in the private chat. Okay, here's the website. It's this is the website. I've been working on this website for almost 28 years. For real. Okay, I've written thousands of articles. So, it's just info at karm.org. That's all. Go to the website and check it out. Okay, I'll check but, it out. Uh, but when we talk again, there's a lot more I want to get into. There's a um, lot more. Yeah. Well, I want to be able to talk about if there's going to be slavery in the kingdom of heaven or not. No.
you saying no now, but we're going to have to deal with logic. Like you said, logic, right? And we're going to have to deal with context. And there's going to be a lot of explaining to do, as Ricky Ricardo would say. So with that, all praises to the Most High, Yahweh, and uh, Shalom. Appreciate you. All right. Just email me. Okay. Okay, everybody. Uh, I got to go. <laughs> got to go. Got to use the restroom and check on my wife. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I'll stay for another minute. You guys can write some comments if you want in there, what you thought uh, before I go. Um, I got to I use the restroom here but and check on Neek and then whatever. So I got to work on a sermon all day tomorrow for preaching on Sunday. I got so much going on. I hope he does uh, write me. Uh, so any comments did you guys did you learn was it fun was it interesting see this is what i actually do away from the radio i actually do these kinds of discussions regularly with people and they'll di disagree and we go over stuff left and right and up and down and i take notes and because sometimes they'll ask me something i don't know and that's you know i can't know everything and i'll take it go away hold on let me put this over here and I, what's your claim about this and then what i'll do later is i'll, I'll take my time and go look at it in context and i'll go I see where the problem is. And then I write out responses. I've done that with Catholics, Eastern Orthodox. I've done it with uh, atheists. I've done it with Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and I and then BHI I'm, I'm expanding on. Yeah, I, I was busting at the hip to try to call you, but I didn't. But from now on, I hope you seize on this, where the verse says the Father and I are one. There's a critical word in there in the Greek. We yeah. are one. And right. they're distinguishing Jesus is trying to claim he's the father. They're one when it's completely and totally turned on, on its head by the, the language itself. He's claiming we are one. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. But what yeah. they're automatically going to do is go to John 17. Yeah. And then you got to get context. You got to say, but I like what I like to do with John one. I mean, uh, John 10 30, you know, father one, they want to kill him. I say, you're agreeing with the Pharisees that he's not. Oh yeah. God. That's, superb yeah I, I love that superb. superb i had one guy go yes i am no i'm not they like that <laughs> go, yeah, too late <laughs> no, all very, right i gotta go everybody very, very very instructive okay so, all right i'm out of here but the lord bless you have a good weekend and uh we'll talk later we'll see ya all right